Good morning. This morning we'll look at a a basic, basic, basic subject. We'll talk about faith. And as basic as faith may be, because as a Christian you have expressed your faith, it's one of the hardest things in the world to keep, to hold, to have, to do, to show, to explain, to define. So this morning we'll look at faith, and when you're looking or discussing or thinking about anything, the, the first thing that you have to do is understand the terms uh, that you're talking about. The Bible actually gives a definition of what faith is. Faith in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 is the substance or the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Your Bible may say substance in that. And just like any other definition of something, that's just kind of cold. It's, a, it's, it's words. It's, it's something on a page. Maybe it, it just feels far away. <coughs> so we'll address that this morning, especially how far away faith may feel. The first question I have is, if you would, I actually need you to raise your hand. Have you ever heard of a church raise? Sweet. Cool. Fire department. They take a sectional ladder, extend it all the way out. Typically, it's a 45-foot ladder. So the extension ladder is stretched all the way out. There's ropes tied to the top. Church, uh, the ropes go in every direction. The firefighter puts on all his big old heavy gear, and it's heavy. Climbs uh, to the top of the ladder. The, the ladder is not supported by anything. It's not leaned on anything. The ladder's raised with two men at the bottom and the ropes. And this is in the middle of a parade ground and you have ropes going in every direction. Two men on each rope, two men at the bottom of the ladder. The ladder sticks straight up in the air. It's held by nothing. It's held by your family. It's held by your firefighters, your, your brothers in battle or, or however you'd like to describe them. It's called a church raise. You climb the ladder all the way to the top. You climb over the top of the ladder so that you can descend the other side. It's held by nothing. It's called the church raise because when you get to the top and you climb over the top, you lock your leg over one rung so that one rung is behind your knee and that the other rung, the one below it, is in front of your ankle. So your leg is pinched between the two rungs. You lay back and you put your hands out. And so as the picture would, would show, you are opening yourself up to the sky. There is nothing between you and the sky. And if it weren't for your family, there's nothing between you and the ground. It's the church raise because it'll make you go to church if you've ever experienced it. We did, I didn't do it at 40 feet, but it is, it is quite the thing to do. Have you heard of a trust fall? Trust fall? Similar, right? Whoever's behind me has got to be there for me. Not only do they have to be there for me, they got to be big enough for me. Bigger concern for some of us. Like, I trust that you may be there. I also trust that you can't stop me. Faith. The only thing that allows you to climb that ladder, go over the top, lock in, the only thing that allows you to lean back, close your eyes, and, and know that your head's not going to bounce off the ground, is that you have faith in something that's there. Jesus lived 2,000 years ago, and he calls on us to have faith. So we're supposed to be able to see things like that in our lives. That means nothing when you're being tested. There is no help when you're being tested, if you don't have anything to base it on, whenever someone comes at you and they have answers prepared and they can tell you that 
evolution is how the world was created. And that there was a big bang, and, and this is scientific numbers for how old stuff is and whatever. Or they give you a story and say that this thing happened, how could God allow it to be? And, it, and it's very compelling. Whenever they show you a scripture and you don't understand it, and you look in and you read and you say, well, you know what, this doesn't seem to say the things that, that I know. Whenever bad things happen in your life, whenever you see people that you love make poor decisions, whenever you realize that this world is broken and bad things happen, it doesn't help you to know that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the substance of things not seen. Those, those words, knowing that definition, doesn't help you any more than knowing the definition of police is someone who keeps order without being able to call on them, without them being able to show up, and I'm not picking on you. But if it's just a word, it doesn't mean anything. And you can come and say, I know about your shield of faith, and I know about some uh, shoes that you have, or some sword that you can work as a Christian, but unless your faith is a real thing, it won't stop anything. Your faith is supposed to be something that you can cower underneath. You say, well, coward is, is cower hiding is not what we're called on to do as Christians. You're right, but God gave you a shield for a reason. He gave you a shield so that you could hide behind it because there are going to be things that are coming at you that will destroy your faith, that will destroy your life as a Christian, and that will break you and hurt you. And that's why you have a shield, because your enemy fights back too. And if you don't have a way to hide, to get away, to get out of the line of sight, or to avoid, you've got words on a page. You've got empty words on a page. It was described for me one time that uh, what was being discussed is not where my mind went after it was brought up but it was being discussed as, as being victorious in battle. And that there will be some Christians who stroll through the pearly gates and their armor will look shiny and their sword will be untested because of whatever stage of life they, they were saved in or because of whatever the circumstances of their life were. Job had a really good life. Nice squeaky clean armor for a long time until it was tested. And there's going to be some people whose life is so hard, who have so many bad things that show up for them, who just keep getting beat down time after time, that when they make it to the gates, they're going to be dragging their shield, and they're going to be dragging their sword, and when they get to it, they're just going to fall forward because they've fought as hard as they could fight, and they don't have anything left. Tell me your life has never felt like that. I don't have anything left. I got a brother who I, I grew up with him, went to church with him for ever until he moved away. Lives in Panama City. If you want to know where the hur where Hurricane Michael came in, it's Panama The picture you've been seeing on the news is from Panama City, not from Mexico Beach. His place was just obliterated. He sent his wife and his children to Houston to stay with his sister. They enrolled their kids in school over there because there's not one in Panama City anymore. The congregations worshiping there worship by memory and by whatever songbooks they have from home and whatever tablet Bibles they have. Everything has been obliterated. His family is in Houston we announced Thomas Allen's name on the list uh, of those who are sick this past week because his elementary school age child had to have an emergency appendectomy in Houston, away from his father. How much more can he handle? His home, his home was not too badly hit. His property is decimated. His family now is hours east or uh, west of him they're stretched not only that everyone in the church family who should be able to help and strengthen 
they're all tested. They're all being just beat. And not only that, it's hot. How much more can you take? How much more can, what is the breaking point? And I, look, I, I'm not miraculous. I'm not trying to claim that I know things that I don't. But with a number as large as we have this morning, there's probably good odds that someone here is being hurt. Someone here is, is, did everything they could just to show up today. Are we here for each other? Faith is just empty words on a page. The word faith is, is just a word if it's not something that you can use and utilize. So two questions. Two questions. First, what is your go-to scripture? When Jesus was arguing, when he was tempted, when he was in the wilderness and, and interacting with Satan, he fought him back with scripture. Satan would tempt him, and he'd say, it is written, go away. It happens three times. What is your scripture? Which one do you pull out of your pocket? Which one do you pull out of your head? Which one do you turn to, and your Bible almost just naturally falls to that place because you have to look at it, you have to hold it close to you? Do you have one? Jesus used this to fight Satan. We should use this to fight Satan. Your Savior has given you an example. If you want to fight against a thing that bothers you, that afflicts your faith, you need a Scripture. You need the Word of God. What do you use? I would encourage you to get one. You may want to write that on your paper. I need one of these. You can look in your Bible. This is a great place to find Scripture. It's in your Bible. Look for one there to help you. Write it on your arm if you need to. I didn't, wouldn't recommend it. You'd look a little silly, but if you need to, do that. Put it where you can see it. The Israelites were encouraged to make the law as frontlets from their eyes, and you can't miss it. Make it something that you know. Make it something that you can quote and you don't have to quote it from whichever version of the Bible that you grew up with. You don't have to quote it from whichever version of the Bible you currently read from. Whatever memory device that you can use to remember some kind of Scripture, get one in your brain that you can fight Satan with. Mine is, is the last one listed here. My mama's is the one above it. And uh, my... High school chorus teachers was Isaiah 430, 40, 31. It helps me to know that no temptation is going to afflict me that has not afflicted someone else. Someone has felt what I'm feeling whenever I'm feeling it. I'm not alone. Not only that, God knows what it feels like, and he knows that I need his help. And that's why that one helps me. Maybe it'll help you. We read out of the same Bible. What's your go-to song? There's a lot of altos here, which means that somebody spent some time learning how to sing alto or at least listening to their mama or aunt or somebody teach them how to sing alto. There's a lot of good sound in this building when we sing something that more than Mark knows. I am thine, O Lord, and whiter than snow are two songs that I keep at the red. I am thine, O Lord, the verses for me mean I'm yours and I need a hug. I'm thine, O Lord, I've heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. Verse 2. I need you to clean me up. Whatever it is, whatever sin that I'm involved in, whatever place that I find myself in, wherever I'm at, I need you to clean me up. Because regardless of how, how hard I'm trying, like Isaiah, I have to be purified. I'm not of a clean people, and you're holy, and I'm not. Verse 3 to me means I come to you to be happy again. I, I, I need satisfaction, and that only comes from you in verse 4 I trust you for my eternity hold me close I need you 
What song do you sing? What what which one do you have at the ready? Because the words I wrote down on my paper are don't talk to me about peaceful shoes or word swords. I'm crying singing Jesus loves me. Because sometimes that's all you can do is close your eyes and remember that Jesus loves me. When you're having problems, when you're facing difficulties, when life is no fun. You need an answer. You need a fix, not a philosophy. And you need to ask God to increase your faith. You need to know that you're going to win. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I'm going to win. And you're going to win. We do a good job of teaching against false doctrine. Sometimes we do that to the detriment of good doctrine. When I tell you that you will be saved by faith, do you immediately think, yeah, but once saved, always saved isn't, isn't a true thing? Do you start thinking of, and baptisms required, do you start thinking of obedience? James chapter 2, works without faith, or faith without works. Just stop. There's a reason some of these verses are separated from other ones. Yes, all of those things are correct. But when you're being beaten down under your shield and it just keeps coming down on top of the shield and banging again, I don't care that your philosophy works in philosophy, I need help right now. And I need my God to fix it right now because I'm hurting. And if we're not ready to do that because we would rather debate philosophy, then we've lost. We're going to go to heaven, Christian. You're going to make it. If you care about going to heaven and you're trying to do it, Every one of us is going to de depend on the mercy of God. And no, I'm not saying once saved, always saved. I'm saying that if you're making an effort, He's going to fix it. So understand you're going to heaven. That's the first step in anything. Because if you understand that you're going to heaven, that's faith. Because no one's ever been there and come back except one. And it needs to be real, not a philosophy. When you're saved, when you have been brought into the blood of Christ, nothing will ever, no external force will ever change that. In Romans chapter 8, if you're, if you're keeping track in your own Bible, go there now. Romans chapter 8, if you're looking for a verse to keep for forever to fight with, go here now. Starting in verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. You cannot be removed from God by anything. For those of you worried about my doctrine, yes, it's by anything but you. If you walk away from Him, you've walked away. That's true. Don't do that. But when you're struggling and you're looking to Him and you're crying singing, Jesus loves me, while Satan pounds on top of your shield, you're not walking away from Him. You're clinging to Him. Cling to Him. You know what else? If you're clinging to Him, you're not ignoring 
Him. You're looking for Him. And you're seeking Him. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. How? I don't know. I don't know how easy how it is that it's so easy for us to just walk away from God. Like the prodigal son just walks away from God. But yet that grip is so tight that nothing can get between us if we're struggling to be his if we're working to be his child. There's a lot of things that I don't know about our under or about our relationship between us and God. A lot of things that man isn't given to know exactly how salvation works in heaven. I understand how it works here. I can prescribe that. And if you need to be saved, we can do that this morning. You can leave here His child. But I don't know what happens to my soul in heaven because that's not given for me to know. Not only that, I don't know how to ask God to fix it. And I don't know what the best answer would be for every scenario and every situation and every... What about the guy in the deepest, darkest parts of wherever that never heard the... God is the Creator. God is the Master and God knows it all and I'm just the guy. I don't have to know. You know what? I don't know so many things that I don't even know how to ask God to help. In the same chapter, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness for we did not know how to pray for we do not know what to pray uh, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words he who searches our hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of god and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. I don't know. I'm not supposed to know. And if I could figure it out, then what would I know? I'd know how God works. If I could figure it out, then I could do it on my own. What has God asked you to do on your own? God wants to be the one that you rely on. He wants to be the one that you look for. And He says that with every temptation, I will provide a way of escape. He doesn't say He's going to take away the problems or take away the temptations. He says that He's going to make a way for you to get through it. And I've heard, and actually I used to say a lot, well, God must think a lot of me if He's going to let me go through this problem. If he's going to let me have this thing to fight. It's like, that's, that's one way of looking at it. But God routinely puts us in situations that we can't fix, that we can't help, and that we can't overcome so that we will know we have to look to him. You can't do it on your own. You can't be saved on your own. You can't fix this world. It requires God. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? God has already given everything for you. He gave His Son. He gave of Himself to come here and allow us to butcher Him and send Him back so that we could immediately in turn ask Him to save us. We can't do it on our own. We're not supposed to. God's people have never been supposed to. We're supposed to look for Him. Look to Him and wait for Him to win. But all of those things require faith. I cannot, and I put the message up here, and you'll notice that this this transliteration is such a mess that that's a pretty good abbreviation for what it is. 
But it does get a pretty good idea for what I'm looking for in this verse from Exodus 14, 14. Keep your mouth shut. I can't say me on my own. Put, put it down and just wait for God to do the work. The Israelites were supposed to wait for God to do the work because He's going to chase people out ahead of them with hailstones and hornets. I still think that's one of the most impressive, and I've said that here, it's still one of the most impressive battle tactics because you can't fight a hornet. You just, you, uh-uh. Imagine it with a baseball bat right now. Three seconds, you all laugh again. You can't fight a hornet. God will fight the battle for you. And you, keep your mouth shut. Wait for him. Understand that you will win. And what you'll find is that as you're waiting for him, and as you're praying to him, Cowered under that shield, singing, Oh Lord, I need a mountain to climb on. Just a quiet place to go and know you're there. Oh Lord, I need to spend some time with you. Spend the night with you, dear Lord, in prayer. That you're no longer cowering under a shield, but you're standing and you're ready to fight back. Because you've gained strength. And the only way that you did that was to kneel and understand that it's not you who can fight. Requires the faith. So, how do we increase our faith? Faith comes from hearing, and hearing from the Word of Christ. Through. Through the Word of Christ. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. So faith comes from the Word. Faith comes from hearing, hearing what? The Word of Christ. And repeating it. Why am I repeating it? Because it's difficult to understand such a simple concept. If I want to increase my faith, I don't need to go through trials. I don't need to uh, exercise, which is great because I don't like exercise. Ask my Fitbit. Um, How do I get it? You increase your faith. Through the Word. Is it really that simple? If you want to increase your faith, read your Bible. This verse literally says, that's exactly what those words mean. If you want to increase your faith, read your Bible. If you need to increase your faith, read your Bible. Listen to sermons. All of these go on YouTube. There are other congregations that I listen to because the only Christian that doesn't have a preacher is a preacher. And I like listening to sermons. I can show you other congregations that I listen to. I would. Some of them are much better preachers than I am. So I won't show you those. Faith comes from the Word. So why aren't we spending more time in the Word? If you're a newer Christian, spend more time in the Word. This makes your life easier. This makes your Christian life easier. What do I read? Read whatever you want. But start and read and do something consistently. You want to know what to read? Next year's sermons, 48 of them. Sorry, Charles, I never finished the other four. 48 of next year's sermons are already written on the board as to what their titles will be. Search words associated with the title of the sermon. And be ready to tell me how wrong I am that coming week. See, I give myself like six weeks of prep for that. How much time do you spend studying for you? Charles appreciates, Jeremy appreciates, I appreciate, if only did, all of us who have taught classes, including the younger classes when children come ready for their Bible classes, all teachers appreciate when the homework is done and you're ready to talk about the subject that is being discussed in class. And I don't want to belittle that or say that that's not important because it truly is. Please be ready for Bible class so we can have a a good discussion about that. But what are you reading for you? What are you studying for you? Where's your daily Bible reading? Do you have an app for that? I I, I can't stand my app for that, so I don't read it anymore. I don't don't use that anymore. But find something that works for you. Do you have a rip-off calendar for every day? Uh, daily devotional or inspirational rip-off calendar? 
Do you get a word of the day? A scripture for the day? There are tools you can use. Let's use them. We can use them positively. The early church spent time together all the time. They were saved. As they were saved, they spent time with each other. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received food with glad and generous hearts. That's important because they didn't have a paper Bible. And they spent a lot of time devoted to one another. Proverbs had already told them that as iron sharpens iron, and one, uh, one man sharpens another, that we encourage each other and we build each other up. And they spent time doing that and increasing each other. We should spend time increasing ourselves. Well, if that doesn't sound like fun, you're going to have difficulty with your faith. In Jesus' first recorded public sermon, one of the early tenets that He gave out is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. If your righteousness, if your relationship with God, if your ability to be a better and better Christian is not something that you hunger and thirst for, what are you doing? Maybe you should fast. Did anyone miss a meal yesterday? Maybe you chose to miss it, that's fine. Did anyone miss a meal yesterday? Every meal? Okay. You knew it when you missed it. Oh, yeah. Do you miss your Bible? Can you go a period of time without your Bible and be okay with it? That's like going a period of time and being okay without food. You should hunger and thirst for righteousness. And that'll be the sermon next week, so I'll step off of that one for, for, uh, for several days. But hungering and thirsting for righteousness will find you satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. Satisfaction is the opposite of anxiety. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time He may exalt you Casting your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. If you find yourself having to run from the devil, having problems with your faith and not knowing how to fix it, maybe you should check your hunger and thirst for righteousness level. Spend more time in the Word. That is how you increase your faith. Satisfaction is the hardest thing to fight. If you can come up with a really great sermon on apathy, or a really great book on apathy, really great something to fix someone's apathy, you'd be a very, very rich person. Because not caring about something is the worst thing that can happen to you. No press is bad press. The lack of press is bad press. If you don't care, then you no longer care. What can remove you from the hand of God? Nothing but yourself. If you don't care, then you've done that. How much do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you today thanking you for saving the word for us that we would be able to look to it and increase our faith, that we would be able to look to it and see how to be who to be. We ask that you would be with us today, that you would help us to hunger and thirst after righteousness, that you would create in us a deeper desire to know who you are, to know how to be more like you. Keep us safe, Lord, and make us strong as we move forward from here, looking to you more and more every day. In your son we pray. Amen. In the scripture that I just used about 
satisfaction and anxiety with giving it to God. The verse continues, resist him firm in your faith. That's that shield. Knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world, it's not just me. You're not alone. I'm not alone. And someone knows how to help you, and someone knows how to pray for you, and someone knows how to lift you up or fix you. And sometimes, and as a guide, this is one of the harder things to understand, sometimes I need to just shut up and hold you. Sometimes you just need a hug. I don't need you to fix it. I don't need you to make it better. I just need you to hold my hand. Maybe I need you to pray. I don't need you to tell me how to make my life better. I just need a hug. I got good arms for hugging. God has created everything that we need and kept it for us in the Bible so that we would know. And then He says, if you want to get better at it, read it more. If you want to get better at it, spend more time in it. Physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual crisis, whatever it is that you're feeling, you are not alone. You're not feeling one of those things. That's great. I see a lot of faces in here that are not hurting. There are some here that are right now. Don't look around. That's not for you to do. What it is for you to do is to lift them up. I hope that you call someone. And it can be me. Please call me. I've got time. I really want to help. Call someone else. We are here to lift each other up, not to beat each other down with philosophy. Bear one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ. Church race. If you're not the guy climbing the ladder, you're the guy holding the rope. First guy, it's real scary. That's okay. You're not the first guy. You're not the first gal. Someone has gone ahead of you. Someone can offer you great advice for that. Someone can point you at a scripture. But we're all here to hold each other up. And that's why I started with that example. We're supposed to be here for each other. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. We just did that. That's cool, huh? Is anyone among you cheerful? Let him sing praise. We'll do that again in a minute. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call on the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Alright, that one's difficult. That one's weird. If you're sick, stay home. If you're sick, stay home. We don't, I don't want to get sick. The words here don't specifically mean if your body is ailing... Let him call for the elders of the church. And that some magic medicine in oil is going to fix you. There are people that think that. They keep their oil next to their snakes. That's fine. They're wrong. The wording here is for spiritual sickness. Just as death and sin are intertwined, so is this idea of sickness or this thing that is killing you. If you are overtaken in transgression, if you are sin sick, ask your brothers and sisters to help you. It's like, well, that's too hard to do. Why? Because you have to admit you did something wrong. And that is the hardest things as Americans that we have taught. If it was wrong, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, if it was wrong, you wouldn't do it, except all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That was A. Hold on to that one. Not only that, no temptation has overtaken you except which is common to man. That means all of you have sinned too. If you wanted to line up and brag about how bad a sin you can produce or what a horrible sinner you are, congratulations, we'll all sit at a table with a beer because that's what a bar is all about. Sitting around bragging about all of the bad things that you can do. We don't want to do that. We want to lift each other up. And we've all done something wrong. How can you be lifted up? The anointing is the idea of fixing. We will pray. We will fix. And if you just have to have the oil, we'll go to the cupboard and grab some Crisco or something. But that means nothing to God because what you need to be anointed with is righteousness. 
and that wordplay goes all the way back to David, King David. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, not the oil, not the snake. And the Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Do you believe it or not? If you believe it, why, why are you struggling alone? Why aren't you letting someone help you? If, they, if, if you believe and you know this to be true, why, why are you not asking someone to help you? Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power and is working and it can do nothing if you're too prideful to admit that you need help. I actually wrote down here, light the beacons for uh, Gondor calling Rohan. Too stubborn? Just can't do it? Just can't do it? You know you need the help. You know you're not going to make it. You know that's one of the hardest things in Alcoholics Anonymous to get people to do? Call your sponsor. They set you up with a sponsor. They say, whenever you're tempted, whenever you need a drink, call your sponsor. Whenever you're having this issue, call your sponsor. Hey, I'm having a hard time right now. I'm driving by the liquor store. I'm drive Y'all don't have a lot of those in the dry county. I'm driving by the gas station. I just need to make it past it. If I can get home in my dry house, I'll be fine. But for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm struggling and I need your help. It's the hardest thing to get people to do. And if you'll notice, it's hard to get people to come to the front or to ask for help when they need it too. It's hard for you to admit that I need a Savior to save me. I need somebody to help me fix it because I can't do it on my own. Because self-reliance is something we're taught from a very young age. But you can't fix it on your own. And you can't be saved on your own. And you've got to rely on Him. All of those things start faith. All of those things increase faith. Brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. This is where I tell you that if anyone were to come and say, I need help, that you're not supposed to go, I can't believe they did. I remember the first time I watched a man walk to the front of the building and admit that he was having problems with pornography. And I remember thinking all of the things that were going through my mind as the man admitted and cried out for help for uh, all of the horrible things that he would put his into, into his brain. Oh, I can't believe that. I, I thought better of him. And I've kicked myself for that time and time again because what should have been going through my mind was, I can't, I've done that too. I've looked at something like that too or I've entertained those thoughts too. We're no better than anyone else. Salvation is one beggar showing another beggar where he found bread. Call on Him. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the Scripture says, everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Scripture doesn't apologize here for not having baptism included in this statement. It says flat out to these already saved, already baptized Greek speakers. If you're a Christian, call on your God. That's the same thing Elijah told the prophets on Mount Carmel, right? You call on your God. And let him save you. If you're a Christian, call on your God and let him save you. The same thing is explained in Acts. From the New American Standard Version, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture preached Jesus to him. And they went along the road and they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip answered, If you believe with all your heart, you may. <laughs> 
And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. If you need to call on God, Philip says this is how you do it. And we believe it. If you need to call on God, if you need Him to fix something and profess faith for the very first time, come up here and let's do that. We can do that right now. See, here's water. What's hindering you from being baptized? Because if that's not where you start, then while your friend is being pounded and is cowering behind their shield of faith, you have to realize you don't have a shield. The armor is armor of God for a Christian. And as Satan is pounding on you, you're just going to take it. That's not what you need to do. That's not what you're called on to do. And you can't make it on your own.